Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. John chapter 7. Here's what it says. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. So Judea is down in the southern part of Israel. Galilee is up in the northern part of Israel. And Galilee is where Jesus was from, up in Nazareth. And then where his new hometown came to be, when he, about the time he started his ministry and his, uh, his uh, you know, the friends, the family members that he had in Nazareth, they wanted to kill him, at least some of the people did. And by the way, you know, they've excavated uh, some places in around the Nazareth area up in Galilee. It's not right on the uh, Sea of Galilee, but it's to the west, some miles. But they estimate that the town that Jesus lived in that is known as Nazareth only had about 40 families. So you, you know, everybody knew who he was. So when they said, don't we know his brothers and sisters, his mom and dad and everything? Well, of course they did. And they tried to kill him, so he moved to Capernaum. But the point is that uh, he moved to Capernaum so that he would have a safe home base to come back as he went on his ministry travels. But down in Jerusalem, oh, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they came to the place where they really wanted to kill him. And so he wanted to stay up in the north where it was a little more removed from the temple and the tension of that atmosphere. By the way, when you go to Jerusalem now, of course, there's not a temple there. On the Temple Mount, there's the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim shrine. And then there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, down on the southern part of the Temple Mount. But there's no temple. But I'm telling you, the spiritual tension, even today, uh, is still high. Very interesting. You go there, and it's just a whole different atmosphere from the Galilee up in the north, even to this day. So Jesus wanted to stay in the north. Verse 2, Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, this is in the fall, now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles uh, was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. So they saw him becoming popular and they thought, Well, he's just trying to be popular and he's doing everything he can to become more and more famous. But it's not true. Jesus was out to do the will of to do the will of God, to accomplish the plan that, and assignment that God had for him. But his brothers were misunderstanding him. So they went on to say, If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him at that point. Later on, yes, they did. And two of his brothers even wrote books of the Bible, namely James and Jude. Verse 6, Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now watch this. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. So he didn't want to make a big hurrah about it. But once they left and he could be more incognito, so to speak, then he went down, went down south. Uh, and it says up to the feast because Jerusalem is at a higher elevation level. So he also went up to the feast, verse 10, not openly, but as it were in secret. Verse 12, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So he has gained tremendous popularity, had a tremendous following. Verse 12, and there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the middle of the 
feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. I mean, in the temple teaching. So here's front and center, so to speak. And the Jews, verse 13, and the Jews, excuse me, verse 15, and the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? In other words, he's teaching so precise from the text of the scripture, but he has not gone to our Bible college, so to speak. He has not gone to seminary uh, uh, to be able to study the way that we know. Of course, they wouldn't call it seminary, but their schools, their higher education schools. How does he know the letters like this? How does he know this level of teaching? Verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So in other words, I learned these things from the Father. I learned from the Father the Scriptures. God taught him the Scriptures. So he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do the will, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. That's a powerful uh, tool of assessment, uh, a litmus test, if you will. He said, if anyone wills to do his will. So if people really had on their heart to do the will of God, then when they heard Jesus teach, or us, and they hear the voice of God, they hear the truth of God, it resonates with them because their heart is to serve that God. But if they're out to serve themselves or if they're out to serve money or have another agenda, then when they hear the truth of God, it does not resonate. They're incompatible, see? And so Jesus is saying, if your heart was really to do the will of God, then you would be receiving what I'm saying because I'm talking about doing the will of God. Verse 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, you have a demon. Can you imagine them saying that to Jesus? You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry? With me, because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now some of them, verse, 20 through, uh, verse 25, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. So, first of all, he is the Christ, which is, means the Messiah, the anointed one. And the, the, I love how the Bible is just capturing the thought of men, the rationale of people, the way people are. And boy, we have people today that are like this with politics and such, and they have their own rationale, but it doesn't necessarily add up or make sense, and it certainly doesn't here. But they're speculating. They're saying... Why can he teach openly in the temple? I, I thought the religious leaders wanted to kill him. And if they're not arresting him right here while he's teaching openly in the temple, then is it because they're afraid? Is it because they think he really is the Messiah or what's going on? This is just the way things were being talked about, the speculation. And this is why the religious leaders were afraid to arrest Jesus publicly because they thought, no, he has so many followers, they're going to come and they're going to, you know, jump on us and they're going to defend him. Verse 28, then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him for I am from him and he sent me. Boy, Jesus is just being so clear here that if you were from the Father, if your hearts were with the Father, you would know me because I'm, if I can say it this way, I'm the spitting image of the Father. I mean, I'm just like him. I talk like him. I believe like him. I have the love like him, the compassion, but also the judgment like him. 
And so if you really loved my father, then you would know me and you would also love me because he sent me. Verse 30, therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So they sought to take him. In other words, they, they sought to take him to arrest him or to you know, begin the process of trying to get him killed. And so, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come, his hour to die. Verse 31, and many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, he will do more signs than these which this man has done. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous because this is the Christ. But nonetheless, that's how we think we know things when we don't know. Uh, he'll do more signs than this. Well, okay. Uh, they were wrong. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him, in other words, to arrest him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he has said? Or that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am coming, uh, where I am, you cannot come. Now watch this. This part is, I think, my favorite part in this chapter. Verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, we're talking about the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, and you can understand this is in the fall, this may be September, October, right in that area, but it can, it can still be very hot in the Middle East. And he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Of course, Jesus is not out there selling water bottles. No, notice what it says next. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So listen again to what he said, understanding that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, we all know that uh, somebody can be filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That means it's coming into you. But I want you to notice when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the way that the scriptures say, and that's what Jesus said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The fullness of the Spirit is not intended just to fill us up so that we feel full and are fulfilled and we have the power of the Spirit for ourselves. The fullness of the Spirit is intended that we are filled up and overflowing, like the psalmist says, my cup overflows. And uh, it's also called being baptized in the Spirit. When you go down into the river or into the baptismal, the baptistry, if you will, or the ocean, wherever you get baptized, and they put you down under that water. I mean, the water is all over you. And this is what being filled with the Spirit means. It means that you're receiving the Holy Spirit inside of you so that you're full. Your spirit, soul, body, your mind is full of Holy Spirit thoughts, and it's overflowing you to where that Spirit is also on the outside. You're completely filled and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It would be like you took a glass and you just filled it up with water more and more and more until it overflowed. Well, now not only is the inside of the glass wet, but the outside of the glass is wet. And if anybody comes up to try to touch that glass, they're going to get wet. In the same way, a, a truly spirit-filled person, I'm not talking about spirit-filled because at some point in their history, they were spirit-filled. I'm talking about somebody that today is filled with the Spirit. We need to continually be filled with the Spirit. Somebody that's filled with the Spirit today, if you come into contact with them, then you will come into contact with the Holy Spirit. And you may even get a word of prophecy or a word of knowledge or a healing or something because of the power of the Spirit on this person and then being filled with the Spirit. And so Jesus is saying, look, 
A person that's spirit-filled out of his heart will flow these rivers of living water. Those rivers not only refresh the individual, but they're giving drinks, spiritual drinks, to other people. And so it's just a wonderful thing that Jesus is talking about, the fullness and overflow of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39. Well, we read that, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would not re- would receive for the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified meaning having been crucified on the cross raised from the dead and glorified in his body and then after that the outpouring of the spirit of course we know that happens in acts chapter 2 verse 40 therefore many from the crowd when they heard this saying said truly this is the prophet it just hit them right they may not have understand Uh, They may not have understood all the implications, but they said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Well, the prophet and the Christ were talking about the same individual from the Old Testament. They didn't know that, though. Some said he's the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? See, they're still speculating and uh, trying to figure it out logically. Verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem? Of course, they didn't know that's where he was born. And that's the family that he was born to, the family of David. So it goes on to say, uh, the town of Bethlehem where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? See, you get close to Jesus. And of course, he was spirit-filled. And you listen to those words. And boy, those words get down into you. And you just, there's something about them that uh, a human spirit just knows that they're true. Now, you may reject them. You may choose to go with the logic of your mind instead of the truth that's being conveyed. But your spirit will somehow know that or feel like that's the truth. And that's what was happening here with the officer. So the Pharisee said, verse 47, uh, are are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Well, as if that would make a difference, right? And by the way, the answer to that was yes. For example, in chapter 3, you remember Nicodemus who was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews, he came and said, we know that you're a teacher sent by God. So he was secretly a disciple and a follower. Verse 49, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So here they are saying, because this crowd is believing in him, well, they're accursed. They're they're a dumb people. Well, it wasn't them that was dumb. It was the religious rulers that were off base. Verse 50, Nicodemus, now here he is, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? See, he's trying to uh, subtly take up for Jesus and keep him from uh, being persecuted. Verse 52, they answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. So, (laughs) praise God, we can see that people were trying to reason with logic, and people do that today instead of going back to the Word, finding out what God's Word said. They're trying to use logic and rationale. But notice even some of the leaders, the religious rulers, who by and large were against him, some of them had genuine hearts. And when they heard Jesus speak, they, they just felt like, oh, This is true. This is of God. And of course it was. Well, wonderful chapter, chapter 7. I look forward to tomorrow, John chapter 8. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's Word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.